Today, I talk to Daniel Dobrigovsky, one of the founders of the Center for Cybersecurity and the head of governance and trust at the World Economic Forum. Daniel has a very impressive curriculum and started his career as a teacher with Teach for America, a service organization in the US, and learned the importance of communicating effectively and meeting people where they are. Most of his career he spent as an attorney in private practice, mainly in litigation on antitrust, intellectual property and privacy issues for and against high-tech companies in San Francisco and Washington, D.C. He also worked on voter protection and election law issues in the U.S. and spent time in academia at the Harvard Kennedy School researching issues related to cybersecurity, internet rights and other policy and governance topics related to advanced technology. In 2015, Daniel joined the World Economic Forum to lead programs on technology governance and was recognized by the National Association of Corporate Directors in its Directorship 100 as one of the most influential leaders in the corporate governance community for work on governance of technology risks. As always, when I talk to my guests, I'm interested of what is not obvious, what is not yet written in the curriculum. I want to learn more about the human, the human behind who impacts corporate integrity, and in this specific case, also in the cyber territory. Let us learn from Daniel's experience when it comes to corporate integrity in the cyber territory. I'm glad to have you here spending the next few minutes with us. Corporate integrity, fraud, non-compliance and cyber security. Would you like to understand the root causes, detect threats and take measurements to protect the most precious assets? As a leader, you need to be prepared and stay actionable in the event of an incident. Sonia Sternemann talks in her podcast, The Human Factor, Corporate Integrity Matters, to leaders and entrepreneurs who want to have impact, foster corporate integrity, and act as role models. As an international expert for corporate governance and integrity, entrepreneur, and independent board member, she knows the challenges. Let her inspire you. Welcome back to this new episode of the podcast, The Human Factor, Corporate Integrity Matters. You might be a board member, executive or non-executive, a business professional, a corporate integrity leader or on your way there. I'm your mentor and sparring partner when it comes to corporate integrity with impact. Founder of Corporate Integrity Concepts with a different formats for corporate integrity leadership. With the vision to protect and secure assets, reputation and actionability, yours and the one of your organization. Why? Because corporate integrity matters to all of us. Now, let's listen to the perspective Daniel brings in. So, hey, Daniel, thank you very much. You are here right now and especially that that you joined now, even though you know it's all about you, your role, and um, the different roles you have, and your own personal experience when it comes to corporate integrity. Because I think that's exactly what our listeners want to hear from you. And you, as a global exposed expert in cybersecurity, our listeners and myself are so curious to learn from you. Okay, well, thank, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to, to chat a little bit. And hopefully something we say is useful to someone else out there. I'm I'm pretty sure it is useful. <laughs> so because I have seen what you already delivered and that what you how you are approaching um the topic, it's just great. And um I would like to dive into the first questions. What what role does corporate integrity play in your environment? Because you as the head of governance and trust at the World Economic Forum, I expect that you must have a lot of challenges. It's true. I, th- I think that you know, in in my work, right? Because the World Economic Forum is a is at its heart a multi stakeholder leadership organization, right? And connects with with leaders around the world and businesses and in governments. Um, they're all very concerned about the ones that we work with. Very concerned about doing the right thing, mm-hmm. right? And part of that is having integrity in the decisions they make. Uh, so increasingly, 
my work is almost entirely involved in how to make decisions around technology and how to govern technologies. Um, and that, I think, is the new frontier for integrity. It's something that not enough people are thinking about how to make good and reasoned decisions around you know, how to use technology, who should be using technology, what you should implement. Uh, and these, um, in, the, in the stakeholders I talk to, these are your key questions that, that's sort of in the front of their mind. And I think you also have, you know, the, the audience you talk to are most of the time, they are already very senior. And what I experience, sometimes they are not as educated as we would need to have them. And it's also difficult to educate them because they already have a certain position. You know what I mean? So what is the experience you have with these kind of sometimes reluctant people? Yeah, well, I think, you know, you've seen, and I and I'm not sure if they're reluctant. I'd push back on reluctant because they come, they come to talk because they want to expand their their areas of knowledge or their understanding. Uh, and what what the difficulty often is is that many times we don't know what we don't understand. Right? We think we have knowledge about a topic, especially if it's in the air, if it's on the news, um, and we think we understand it, but we don't. Um, so I think that you know being able to educate folks um, on some of these new topics that aren't in their their usual realm uh, is really you know, rewarding to me, especially. I mean, I started my career as an educator. I was a high school teacher mm -hmm. in the U.S., um, and I think that you know the skills I learned there, meeting people where they are, helping people understand, wa patiently walking people through questions and helping them find the answers has really served well because ultimately we're all trying to learn and we're all trying to figure things out, and that's true of senior leaders as well. And I mean, most of the people we work with, like you said, right. They're at the CEO level or, you know, almost there or future CEOs or board members or, you know, ministers. Um, and, you know, these folks got to where they are because of their experience in leadership or in a particular field. And very few people started out in technology fields because by the time they're, you know, they're at where they are, where they started, you know, these technologies weren't as pervasive, right? Absolutely. Um, so you have a lot of people who came from accounting or law. Uh, or you know, business strategy, um, where they have a, a certain set of skills and a knowledge base around those topics, and they need to build up their understanding of what technology is, what cybersecurity means, what their responsibilities are. Mm -hmm. um, so that educational role is one I take really, really seriously in, in, in my work here at the forum. And when you, you know, when you go back to your priority list, you have, I think also for you or your team, because you're heading an entire team doing that. So What is the most important part? Because I know all the, the reports also from, from the global, um, from, the, the, from the WEF, you know, what kind of risks and trends they have um, at the top. But now you as a leader in that environment, I, just, I have just seen that, for, for example, last year, cybersecurity really lost priority because I think it was also different. It was a different approach how you did the report. And there was a little, some, somehow I was surprised because for me, it's so important that we still have it on our agenda and it's a must top five um, topic for me. So could you elaborate a little bit on that? Because I think it's important that we are not losing it, you know, that we are not going to put other topics um, above of that. Sure. Well, I mean, last year, um, in for example, in the forum's global risk report, as you can imagine, and I think rightfully so, one of the biggest risks facing society and governments and businesses was this pandemic that we're all yeah. living through. Right. Um, that being said, the way we have been able to continue functioning as society has been through digital and electronic mm -hmm. communications, which has exposed us to all sorts of new um, cybersecurity risks, all sorts of new digital risks. Um, so I think what, what we've seen and what's, what's reflected in the, the report still is, even though there are these environmental risks, right, we're seeing significant risks from climate change. We're seeing the pandemic as a, as a significant risk. Probably the number one human-caused risk is digital risk. It's cybersecurity risk. Uh, and because that's human-caused, that's almost entirely within our ability to affect, right? So I think that it's still top of the agenda. There are you know, reasonably you know, other risks that we have to cover. Um, but I think that that's, you know, when you talk to boards, when you talk to CEOs, they're able to keep a number of different risks running in their heads and they, they work against each other too, right? 
like I said, right, dealing with the pandemic opens us up to cyber risk. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so this is something that I think will continue to be at the top of the agenda, especially now that we're in sort of like the um, the sort of ultra fast phase of digital transformation. Thank you very much. I'm so I'm so glad that you also um, that you also bring that up because I was some because I also had discussions with our clients. You know, for example, they just told me, "Hey, normally you always reference back to the VEF report, and now you see it's not not on the top five anymore." I said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." But you know, I don't know whether you also um, followed up the ACFE report, what we did in May, September, and November last year. You know, mm -hmm. the increasing yeah. cyber risk and what we expect just from our profession. It's huge. And I think it's so important that we are not losing track of that because what I have seen also at the client side is that we really have more incidents than we ever had before, especially in that environment. Right. I think that's absolutely right. And it's because the the platform on which attacks can take place is so much larger than it's ever been. Yeah. Um, when it's one thing to, you know, some businesses didn't have work from home policies before, some businesses you know, didn't extend the borders of their internet to every single employee's house. Well, now that's the norm, right? Mm -hmm. So now the, you know, when you, and you know this, right, what we call the attack surface is the entire world right, in a way that it wasn't mm -hmm. in the past. Uh, and I think that increasingly as we, you know, and, and as we should, right, we're continuing to network more and more people so they can take advantage of, of the opportunities that being connected to the internet affords. But as we connect the next 4 billion people, that attack service is just going to continue to increase yes. um, just from a human factors perspective, right? Um, so is, we're going to see this. And what is your, you know, when you, if you have a, a scale from one to 10 with regard to that, what do you think? Where are we right now? I have an opinion, but I also would like to hear it from your side, you know? Ten Where are we in terms mean, of uh, yeah, ten cyber would, risk? Would we are quite, yeah, the, the cyber risk and also the human factor, you know, because I think from a technology perspective, we are much better than from a human perspective. That's just what I think, because I'm also not a tech person, I'm, you know, and how do you see that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the technology is there. This isn't a technology problem. And I say, I say this a lot, right? It's a human problem. It's a problem of how we make decisions mm -hmm. uh, about something that is new or unfamiliar. And, you know, the way we make decisions now just about network connectivity, about cybersecurity, this kind of trains us to make decisions later for better or worse around quantum or around AI or already around, you know, IoT issues. So if we learn to make good decisions about technology now, about cybersecurity now, it helps us make good decisions about these new and upcoming technologies that we're going to continue to see at a faster and faster pace. So I guess, you know, as far as cyber risk, I feel like it's somewhere around a six or a seven. And some of that is because it's so new to us, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of room for those risks to grow. <laughs> okay. So because I think I would, I would expect it or the, just the opinion I have and the perspective I have on it is a four to five, <laughs> maybe be, just because we are sure. in different countries. Um, I think we talk a lot about it, but we always try to put it back to, to IT and it's not technology. And we have... That's just what I think. We really have to make sure that people are aware of the risks they could have, you know, and especially as you said, over the last 18 months, our process has also changed. And um, if we would like to go into a transformational phases with our businesses, what we have to, because I, th I think a lot of business models, they will not survive the next few months or years if they are not going to adapt. I think that's absolutely right. I think that for too long, right, leaders in business and in government too, have looked at cybersecurity and technology risk as just a function of their IT departments, mm -hmm. right? pushing it down to sort of the lowest level of responsibility. But I mean, for the forum, um, we recently came out with a, a report on principles for corporate governance of cyber risk. And we say that you have to think of cybersecurity as not just a risk to the whole business, but as, a, as an enabler, a strategic mm -hmm. enabler of how your business can work. Um, and that's true of any organization, right? At this point, good cybersecurity enables you to fulfill your mission. Um, and I think that because it's so important, we need to see people recognizing it at that board level, at that senior management level, uh, in a way that it hasn't been in the past. Yeah, absolutely agree on that. But now you brought up another point, you know, and that's, it just came into my mind. What is your opinion about having 
special committees also in the boards, in the non-executive boards. Because I think that's also questions we have to raise now, because we have our risk committees, we have our audit committees, we have our nomination committees. We could think about having it as part of the risk committee, but some, sometimes, and depending on the industries we are in and also about the size of a company, I could also think of having an additional committee just taking care of the cyber territory. It's not only risk, you know, it's just the entire cyber territory we have to manage and we have to oversee as board members. Definitely. I think that, you know, this is something that, you know, I have the privilege of talking to a number of boards, even though I don't sit on a public company board. Uh, I talk to a number of board members and I get to see as part of my work how different uh, systems work. Uh, and some boards uh, of leading companies, uh, they have set up specific mm-hmm. cyber risk subcommittees. Might be a subcommittee of the risk or the audit committee, and that's absolutely true. Uh, some others have set up kind of overall technology committees mm-hmm. where they think about cyber risks, new technologies. And I think that's that integrated, like holistic approach can be really helpful for a lot of companies and a lot of organizations. Um, so I've seen it done different ways. Um, in the US, you know, we have a debate that that goes on every once in a while, a bill comes before Congress about whether they should have a cyber expert on the board um, to kind of more fine tune that. I, I, my concern about that sort of thing is that, and I guess with the cyber committee as well, is that the board, the, the, the main bulk of the board is just gonna shuffle off responsibility to that Absolutely. person or that committee, but it, and it should be a whole board uh, issue. I think, no. Uh, no, it's not. I think I would like to have the boards trained on cybersecurity because exactly what you say. It's not going. It, I think it's not enough if if you just have one expert because having one is a minority again in a board of how many people. No matter how many people they are, you know, it's just a minority, and it's easy to just have one and saying, "Hey, you are responsible for it. Just make it happen and make sure that the risk is going to be eliminated." It doesn't make sense at all. I think we have to train our boards and make them aware of the. Overall, and as you said, holistic um, responsibility we have as board members. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, you know, boards have to understand you know how cyber, how digital connectivity affects their whole business in the same way we expect them to understand you know how to read the books exactly. or how to find a good CEO, right? Um, mm-hmm. the, the, it's all it's within their it's you know within their realm of expertise. It's just a slightly different way of thinking, um, and, and it's you know new knowledge. It's for me, it's a strategic and competitive advantage you are going to have if you are, if you are able to manage it. And if you are not, you won't be in the game for, for many years. I think that's right. I think because that's right. I think it's be, yeah. Yeah. It's increasingly becoming uh, a strategic issue. Mm-hmm. And it's becoming part of the company's reputation. Uh, I think as people get concerned about things like their personal data. And I know that this is um, a really advanced conversation in Europe. And I think it's it, it picks up all the time in the US as well. But people are worried about how well companies are being stewards of their information, of their online identities. And so I think cybersecurity, it's not the only thing that people are worried about, but it's a huge component. If you can't guarantee Mm-hmm. security of people's personal data. Well, you also can't guarantee that you're using it ethically because you can't guarantee you're the only one using it. So I think that increasingly as people look at, you know, which companies they respect, which companies' reputations uh, are are sort of, you know, good examples for the next 10, 15 years, it's going to be those companies that take cyber issues seriously. Absolutely. And, you know, especially when you are in the financial services environment, it's one of the topic. You know, it's all about data. And where do we have our data right now? It's all in this, it's all in our territory of cyber. You know, we hardly have any um, physical data when it comes to these um, sensitive data here. Right. Yep, absolutely agree. So when we talk about integrity and cyber, also cyber um, security, have you ever been in a position, just you as a person, when you were somehow at risk when it came to integrity and maybe also to cyber integrity, because that's another field we could talk about maybe hours, the, the integrity of cyber, integrity of data and how we behave yeah, with that. Yeah, I think that, you know, this, it's an area where, and I think you've done a great podcast on this, it's an area where the norms aren't set fully. Like we come in with some expectations that we're coming in from other areas um, and they're they're not quite there. And I definitely, you know, I have people in my family who are, who are older, Mm -hmm. who, you know, I often have to 
you know, coach through how to engage online. And um, I've definitely found, you know, older folks uh, in my personal life who have fallen victim to some of these scams and things that are online. Uh, and absolutely that, you know, infringes on the overall integrity of the, of the household. I think that that's, that's a significant concern. So like being able to, to educate people in your personal life, if you understand these issues is hugely important. I think there's a number of good resources out there that I use, like the Electronic Frontier Foundation has a great set of resources for how to talk about cybersecurity with your family, how to understand your personal risk profile. Um, and I think these are the kind of things that that people worry about when they worry about their integrity. As far as far as I, you know, as far as I know, and I, you know, hesitate to say this on something that's going to be live. I haven't had any major issues. I probably will now because someone's going to try to prove me wrong. You um, are a target yeah. right now, Daniel. Be <laughs> sure, careful. everyone. No, yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. And you know, I think also I don't know how you um, experience that, but sometimes people think you are a paranoia. And no, we aren't. We just know what could go wrong out there, isn't it? Right. It's like what they say: you're not paranoid if everyone is out to get you, right? Yeah, That's the- absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, but even there, right? We have to be realistic about about you know what the situation looks like. Uh, so, like the average private citizen on the street, no, a definitely. state actor is probably not after them. No, definitely a not. A big company, a bank, you know, a big IT company, you know, they have a they they should be as paranoid as they can be. I imagine. And, you know, I think also when you outsource, and that's a discussion I have, you know, sometimes we really rely on providers and we outsource our data and we outsource our processes. And we have to be sure that we understand to whom we are going to do that. Because we are, as a small ones, they are not going to be targeted. But the ones you outsource your data to might be a potential target for them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have never in my life cared about supply chain as much as I had over the past few yeah. years. And you know, your technical supply chain, right? Your software vendors, your cloud provider, all of that stuff matters. And and you know, there's the there is a concern I have that mm-hmm. just like we're seeing a physical supply chain crisis because of the pandemic, we could have cybersecurity incidents that lead to a digital supply chain mm-hmm. crisis. Um, and I used to, you know, I used to joke because there, there used to be a billboard on the street. My wife and I would, would joke about it because it, it was for a business school and it was a person that said, I'm passionate about supply chain. And this was like 15 years ago. And we said, oh, that's kind of a funny thing to be passionate about with that. And now I guess I wish more people were passionate about supply chain because that's what we need. I think that's one of the key areas we have to make sure that people are trained, you know? Yeah. I think I don't know whether you have heard about the supply chain um, law we are going to have in, in, um, in Germany, for example. And um, it's interesting, we can also have an offline, disc- an offline discussion about that, but they really focus now on the supply chains and, uh, chains and the governance and the compliance on that. And I think it is important because that's what we have seen and experienced over the last few months. We have an issue and it's not even um, cyber related right now. Definitely not. And But if it is, we are going to have huge um, issues out there. And we, I think there are some... Very serious examples also in the U.S. What happened over the last few months? Huh? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And you know we've seen it. And yeah. this is sometimes this is what it takes, right? We t- it takes these crises to have it rise to the leadership level. But we see people acting on it, right? Like in the U.S., we saw President Biden's executive order uh, talking about cybersecurity and supply chain, and it's you know, really, really important. We see these things happen coming up out of out of Europe as well, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like you mentioned, so it's it's good that people are taking taking initiative to, to sort of work on these issues and secure the, the overall supply chain. Um, but, and I think it'll bear fruit. But as humans, most of the time, we have to learn it the hard way. Right. Prevention is still not the most, how should I say, to be, to be um, politically correct, but prevention is still not what people would like to do even right. though they would spend much less money if they would invest a little bit in prevention and awareness and training of the entire crew they have on board. It's true. It's true. And, but this is, again, like you said, right, it's human nature. I mean, it it's a, there's like a cliche, right? It's been around for 200 years that you know an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, but no one will do the preventative thing. And it's true in health. It's true in, in business in general. Um, we're we're kind of geared toward dealing with crises rather than looking forward and preventing them. 
And sometimes, um, sometimes yeah. you also make jokes, you know, to our potential clients or clients that, okay, it's no problem. Just call me in a, in a year when you really have an issue. If you don't want to spend the money right now, it's okay. We are just coming back. You know? And, you know, sometimes it is really like that. And I think we are not going to change it. But the more we talk about the topic itself, I think it already helps. And if also if they learn from others what could go wrong, it is just just a start. Right, right. And that's why, you know, uh, finding external expertise is so important here. Yeah. Like you see boards now, or at least highly effective boards on cyber, doing things like, you know, tabletop exercises or war games um, and trying to talk through what could go wrong and yeah. make a plan. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to have this external expertise coming in um, or expertise from, you know, external to the board or from within the company coming in to help explain, you know, what the worst case scenario is. So seeing that kind of scenario planning or the, the tabletop exercises um, coming up more and more with boards is, is really helpful, I think, because unless you force yourself to think about the future and plan for the worst case scenario, it's human nature never to do that. Absolutely. And we call it, you know, we call these kind of exercises thinking like a fraudster. That's what we do with our clients. Said, you know, good. really putting people together and say, "Hey, that's just a safe space." We really think, how could we attack ourselves? And it helps if you have people together and thinking about the weaknesses you have in your organization. You come up with so many different um, potential risks you never had on your agenda before. It's true. Yeah, yeah. And the more this is where you know, the more people you have in the room to be creative um, about how to ruin your company, the better off you'll be because everyone, you know, in the group <laughs> hopes for the best and they're not going to implement these things, but you have to be able to prevent them. Um, so that's, you know, it's great that people can get together and do that. I like thinking like a fraudster. I think that's it is, you know, and you know, we only, or I think we only have to moderate it. We have to educate and moderate. And they know what could go wrong already, but often they are not talking about it because they are also not asked in that way. And it's really about asking the right questions, putting them together and using that now to also to improve the, the situation they have on site, either it's internal control system or technology or whatever, you know, that we just implement what they brought up. Because if you have that, I think we have at least 80 to 90% of our prevention part done. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. And I think what you, what you said there, asking the right questions, that's a brilliant point. Um, when we think about senior leaders, right, or boards, CEOs, those folks, there is, they're not going to do any of these activities, right? They're, they're not literally in charge of the cybersecurity of the company or like running a SOC or something like that. You know, these people, their job um, is to ask the right questions of all the managers. So, you know, they don't, have to necessarily be experts they have to understand what are the right questions and you know we've put together in the past um a body of work for for corporate boards about like you know when you have your CISO in front of you which is increasingly common uh, to have the CISO brief the board here are some questions you need to ask um so and and here are potentially good answers so we lay that out for them and i think that you know having that level of understanding of the topic is really really vital because you know corporate board what you know corporate boards do not executive directors is they they ask questions right they don't necessarily they and do i the think work. at the moment they do not yet ask enough questions because they are just not yet trained so that's another point because i think also our listeners if you have a link you could share with us i would also put it to the show notes it would, would be great especially also these kind of questions because that's just a start and the more the more people out there doing that and asking these questions, I think the more, the more normal it's going to be, and we can also educate our board colleagues um, with these kind yeah. of approaches. This would be absolutely. Great. So yep. Thank you. We'll absolutely much. sure. We also take that up. So, if you would have, <laughs> or how should I say, your personal wish in that environment of cybersecurity and educating them, the boards and the C levels, to prevent their assets. What would the wish be your yeah, wish be you have now for the next few months? I think that in the next few months, I would wish that boards become more curious about this topic. Um, that they there I've seen very effective boards where they go out of their way and they make you know appointments with their CISO or chief technology officer to talk through cyber issues sort of informally. Um, I think that. So my wish would be that, you know, more and more board members and CEOs turn this into their hobby. 
uh, that they become excited about it, that they ask questions about it, they read books about it. There's plenty of stuff written mm-hmm. at all different levels. So I, I wish that people would take that up. That's great. You know, becoming more curious and make it to a new hobby. That's great. Because that's what we do. I think that's what we both do, isn't it? That's how we get into that topic. We are just curious and we would like to learn. We would like to understand and we would like to challenge what's going on. So I think this was yeah, very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Any other any other tip you would like to give? I think the more the Generation X, for example, because Generation Y, um, they are already more sensitized on these topics. What should the Generation X learn? I think that um, being able to explain how these systems work is really, really important. I think you've seen, right, when, when you see people who are digital natives, it's just there. Um, so you don't delve into uh, the, the mechanisms, the processes mm-hmm. that kind of underlie these technologies. And you're definitely, and many people are definitely not able to explain them. So I think, you know, you use these tools and they are tools, right? We use these mm-hmm. technologies. Understanding how to fix them, how to work with them um, could be everybody's job. It could be something everyone does. And I'd like to see more of that from you know a whole host of different generations, mm-hmm. but especially the people who kind of take it for granted. Perfect. So thank you very much. So thank you very much for your contribution today, Daniel. It was so interesting. And um, as promised, all your information you would like to share with us is going to be published also in the show notes for our listeners. It was a pleasure to learn from your experience. And I wish you all the best for your future and also the impact you would like to have in the space of cyber territory. And especially also that the wishes you have right now are going to be true over the next few months. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Thank you for your leadership on this topic as well. I really appreciate it. And I I enjoyed the conversation. This was the episode number 36 of the Human Factor Corporate Integrity Matters. Following the motto, Corporate Integrity Secures and Empowers Individuals and Organizations. Thank you for listening. Listening to that very interesting interview with Daniel. My name is Sonja Stierniemann and I'm your host. Stay curious, actionable and a role model. Take care and goodbye. Would you like to learn more, meet peers and getting qualified? So visit the website Corporate Integrity Concepts or Corporate Integrity Academy. Or do you think this podcast could be interesting for someone you know? Sharing is caring and we are always happy to welcome your peers to our community. And if you like this episode, subscribe and don't miss any of the future ones. The show notes are, of course, enriched with the relevant information and your connection via any of the social media channels is highly appreciated and will be answered. Promised. And please do not forget, topics of your interest or interview partners are highly welcome. Just send me a note on any of the channels you know.